Starting off with uh, a bang with some great music from our bell choir. May we uh, have an attitude of worship. May we hear God speaking to our hearts and attuning, attuning us to his mercy and graces as we hear our prelude from our bell choir this morning.
Rocky Bell Choir, and they'll be back later in the service. Well, hey, I'm so glad that you are here with us today, joining with us in worship. I'm so glad to be. I don't get to be over on this side with you at this time in the morning very often, and it's been a couple of months, actually, so I'm very glad to be with you today, and uh, if you would, fill out those blue pads. Leave your mark. Show uh, that you are here today. There on those pads, filling out your registration pads there, your attendance today. It really helps us out. Also, if you're new or a visitor among us, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, or if your contact information has changed, let us have your contact information so that we can keep up with you the rest of the week and the rest of the time. Uh, also, if you're joining us online through um, YouTube, we're so glad that you're joining us today. If you would just comment down in the comments section there on the stream, it really helps us out also to have a record of your attendance there. But we're just thrilled that each of you are with us. May we just feel and know God's love and God's power and God's grace is with us now. May our trust in Jesus just grow. May the Holy Spirit work on our hearts and minds and transform us in this time of worship as we begin with our first hymn. Good morning, everyone. Would you please stand with me and join me in singing, Up From the Grave He Arose, number 322. stand if you're able and join me into the prayer for elimination. <laughs> oh God of endurance, by the power of your Holy Spirit, restore our stride with you, that in these words of scripture and sermon, we may run freely with Christ, in which in name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Listen as God speaks to us through the reading and hearing of Psalms 65. Praises do, praise is due to you, O God in Zion. 
and to you shall vows be performed. O you who answers prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of inequity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to leave, live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance. O God of our salvation, you are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the forest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roarings of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and in the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for you so have prepared it. Your water is furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills grid themselves with joys. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain and they shout and sing together for joy. Uh, at this time, I invite the kids to come forward. We'll spend a few moments together. Choir and everybody. Hey, how many of you all like have ever actually run in a race? Anybody ever run in a race? Anybody think they might someday want to ever run in a race? Okay, got some folks there. All right, very good. Well, so, okay, so you've run a race with your brother. Yeah, what were you saying over here? I'd probably be getting come at last. You'd probably come in last. Yeah, well, that's about where I usually came in races. That doesn't stop me. So um, I've been in some races. Hey, I didn't win any of them. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, all right. So I'm going to get ready for my race now. I have to have on my headband in order to uh, uh, catch. I'm, I sweat a lot, so I got that. And I also got my, got my sweatbands here to put on my arms. I wear these always on the 4th of July, too. Um, and uh, so we'll put those on there, very good, so I can wipe my brow if I get sweaty. Plus, you know, it's, it's probably a lot of times, hey, I'm going to run a race now, and I need two volunteers. Are a couple of you willing to uh, volunteer for me here? <laughs> anyway, I need two volunteers. All you got to do is hold the finish line for me. All right, you'll do it. Anybody? All right, the acolytes are going to do it for me. All right, very good. All right, so we'll have you all come over here. Oh, and I get a prize. I get a Tootsie Roll if I win. Um, but all right, so if, here, come on over here. Take that end, if you would. Stand right there. Elena, you come over here. Take this end for me. Very good. All right. I'm going to actually make it a bit of a race. So, um, I'm going to, or Mina, uh, run. All right, so you ready? All right, now, can you say on your mark, get set, go? All right, so I'm running, I'm going. Man, I'm going in my race, I'm going, and I'm already starting to get tired. Wait, wait. Oh, you know what? This is, this is just too much work, man. You know, I, uh, I don't know. 
I mean, is it, is it really worth it? Do you think I should finish the race or should I just quit? I should keep going? Okay. All right, I'll keep running. And, oh, yeah, should I finish slow or should I finish strong? Strong, strong. All right, hold on tight then. Hold on tight to your ends. Hold on tight. You ready? All right, so, yeah. All right, I finished the race. All right, very good. Thank you all. All right, so now I get my Tootsie Roll. Very good. Tell you what, I'll also let you all have a Tootsie Roll. Part of my celebration of winning the race. Here, you all let me get a Tootsie Roll, too. There you go. You were the, yeah, everybody. All right, there you go. You get one, two. All right, very good. So, the reason that I was doing that today is, is that both, we're right now in the sermon series, and today's the second week of it, well, it's called the last finish line. So y'all were, y'all were my finish line, right? I had y'all hold my finish line. Um, so what do you think it means in this case when we talk about the last finish line? What is the last finish line in this life? It's when we die, right? Death. Yeah, death is the last finish line in this, in this life. And we want to do it well, don't we? We don't want to like give up before the end. We want to stay strong for Jesus across no, no, we don't. Yeah. And so we stay strong with Jesus till the finish line. And uh, is there ways, and sometimes do people want to, you know, they start out with a good faith in Jesus and then do they just kind of decide to give up on it? Say what? It's, second, it's the second week of it. We started it last week. And uh, yeah, and it's uh, going to be over after next week. But anyway, the, on the three weeks we're talking about the scripture Paul last week talked to us about. Is it almost over? Well, it has a little bit to go. So, uh, but yeah, so last week we talked about Jesus saying, hey, it's the way you live is the way you die. So if we're living well for Jesus now when that time comes, and hopefully for you guys, it's a long, 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 long time till you die, right? But you never know. And so um, until that day. Yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully 80 yeah, yeah, there's people even older than that in this room right now, so, yeah. yeah, so we're so excited for you guys in long life, but the way you live now is going to determine whether or not you finish the race well. Now, if I decide to go on a whole marathon race, and I just didn't do any training, I just went from not running at all and trying to run 26 miles, how do you think that would go for me? I would not win, I probably wouldn't even finish, right? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, you can turn around and go the other way. No, thank you. All right. Yeah, so on these, on, and yet in the life of faith, it's we keep on going, and Jesus will help us, but we have to stay close to him, right? And so we stay close to him. We come to church. We pray. We study our Bibles. We do acts of service for others. We do things like that so that when the time comes, when the end of the race comes, we know that we've run it well and that Jesus <laughs> is going to welcome us, right, yeah. with a victory, something far better than a Tootsie Roll. At the finish line. I also eat the Bible for breakfast. You read the Bible for breakfast? I eat it. You eat it for breakfast. How do you do that? I just cut it. Oh, okay. Well, that's one way to take it in. All right. All right. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this day and your love for us. And God, just help us to run this race well so that we feel and know your love and are with you, knowing that you're encouraging us every step of the way. And you want nothing more for us to win and spend heaven and Uh, with you in heaven, with you forever. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, so they go back to their seats. Let's sing the second verse of Seek You First.
Hear now the appointed epistle reading from the second Timothy chapters four, verses six through eight. As for me, I am already being poured out as libation and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who has longed for his appearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. So we're talking right now about how, and the topic today really is how to die well. It's kind of the topic of this whole series, but that phrase on how to die well can be taken several different ways, can it? I uh, was thinking this week about Jan and I's middle son, Solomon, when he, he's 20, 24 now, yeah, uh, when he was about three and four years old, he loved and would do almost anywhere these very dramatic death scenes. Remember, he's three or four years old at the time, doing these very dramatic death scenes all over the place. He would, I mean, we could be in Walmart in the checkout line, we could be at church, we could be anywhere, uh, we could be at home too, and Solomon would start doing so. He would start by staggering around, like he just can't hardly make it, and then you know, uh, you know, he'd start choking and coughing, and then, um, and I'm kind of most proud of this part because uh, I think that his mom and I were the ones that gave him the eye to do this. Right before he would just collapse to the ground, he would say, tell them my story. <laughs> and then just collapse to the ground. And he would just lay there silently still. Again, remember, we often were in the Walmart checkout lane <laughs> at the time. And he would lay there still enough and long enough that people would like start really actually getting concerned for him. <laughs> and it really didn't make his mom and dad look that great when we were just largely ignoring this terrible scene that was unfolding right there. And they'd be like, is he, is, is he okay? Are you sure he's all right? And uh, we're like, get up, Sol yeah, Solomon, come on. We've got to move up. People are waiting for us in line, uh, you know, or whatever it was. And so, you know, that's, that's one way of thinking about dying well. Uh, um, maybe that, you know, the dramatic death scenes others were telling me after first service about their kids having heart fake heart attacks in the uh, concourse at the airport and other things like that that their, their kids had done. You might have similar stories too, but, but that is not the way of dying well that we're talking about today. Now, another element of it, now, and it's not the one that's really our subject either, though, is something we're going to cover in a special event next Saturday here at the church from 9 to noon. Um, it's about our, about our legacy, finishing well. And what this one's particularly about is um, getting yourself prepared and your family prepared for end-of-life issues. And so Jay and I are pretty excited about going to this next Saturday. It's going to be from 9 to noon here at the church. There's going to be people here from the Oklahoma United Methodist Foundation. There's going to be, Shiloh's going to be talking some about kind of writing, they're going to be talking about having your will and your stuff together. It's actually going to be, you're going to receive a, something called a knock box, which knock in this case, N-O-K, stands for next of kin. And it's to have the box that whenever 
God forbid we were to pass on and our boys are the ones left behind us that there's this box they can go to that will basically have everything they need to settle up our affairs and know what to do in those last moments. I'll tell you, my grandfather, my mom's dad, he was a prison guard that retired out of the reformatory at El Reno when the year I was born he retired. But um, in any case, he was a master at this. When, when he and my grandma ended up passing away many years later, um, they, I was an adult by the time both of them passed away, but he had every detail so lined out for mom that it made it so easy. He had known, he had researched when to put and or or between names and all these things that meant that very low taxes were paid. Um, mom and dad were able to take care of things so much more easily, no probate court or anything like that. Um, and so those are some of the things we're going to be covering next next Saturday in that event. It's $60, but it includes you getting the knock box and also that you get um, lunch from Olivetto's. Um, so uh, we would love to have you join us. You can register. There's a little box in the announcement section of your bulletin that gives it where you can go in online and register. I will say also too, I had asked this question. I said, well, Jan and I only need one of the knock boxes. Do we need to pay for one or two registrations as a couple? And she said, just one. So just one little piece of information to let you know if that's something that you would benefit from and, and be able to come to next Saturday. So anyway, but that's not really what we're talking about either. Now, in this last Finish Line series, last week we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And in that is where Paul talks about that uses the imagery of fighting the fight uh, and being an Olympian in training. You know, they had Olympics back in those days, the ancient Olympics, and the Isthmusian Games were there near Corinth where Paul was writing to, and they knew how much training it took for somebody to go and compete in the Olympics and makes it clear that we have a race ahead of us and how we live that out, whether or not we're training or living well now to be prepared with our faith and our life for when that end time comes. We, we've got to be careful how we live our lives and be living disciplined lives that enable us when that time comes to face it well. And then you skip forward here to 2 Timothy. You may know that Timothy is much younger than Paul. It's Paul's young protege. Paul has known Timothy for most, if not all, of Timothy's life. He, Paul knows his mom. He knows his grandma, Lois and Eunice. Um, he's known them a long time. And, but, but Paul makes it very clear at the beginning of this passage that he doesn't have much time left in this world. It's coming to an end. He says, already... I'm being poured out as a libation, was your translation. Other translations say I'm being poured out as a sacrifice. His life is being poured out and the bottle is nearing empty. And he makes it very clear that his time in this world is not much more. We don't know exactly how old or even what condition Paul is in at this point. Most scholars believe, though, that Paul, and you know, if you... In the Bible itself, we don't really get to the very end of Paul's life. At the end of the book of Acts, he's in prison, and he's probably in a dungeon, and he's awaiting his appeal. He's essentially on death row, uh, not for having committed a murder, but for states, the crimes according to the state, and, and uh, people being scared of his message and what he's spreading. Um, and so he's in a dungeon, way up to find out whether or not his appeal is going to work or whether he's going to be killed um, be executed by, this, by the Roman authorities. Um, so one way or the other, whether it's that he's sick or that he just knows death is coming soon, he is very much in a state of contemplating his life and his death. And then it's up here on the screens, the most famous three phrases from the scripture that um, Bob read for us just a few minutes ago. Um, you can just say it with me if you want. I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Isn't that beautiful? Wouldn't you love when the time comes to be able to say that with full confidence? I have fought the fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He, you know, Paul isn't known for his humility um, overall. A lot of times he says some pretty bold, brash things 
Um, he's not saying he's wrong when he says them, but they're, they're pretty confident, we'll just say. And this is one of those. He, but he's, he's right. He has lived. I mean, think about all Paul did. And, you know, he had said in that other verse, he had said, now, I'm running the race, but, man, I need to be careful myself so that... I don't get to the end and having brought all these other people along and they all finish the race well and they get the reward, the salvation of their soul, they get to go to heaven. I don't want to be one that after he's brought so many others along, I falter and fall short myself. But now he's at the end and he can say, guess what? I made it. I've done it. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful place, right? To be at, to finish well, to know that you can die well because you lived well. I've, uh, and, and by the way, you have come to the right kind of Christian church today if you want to know about dying well. We have a long reputation in history as Methodists of dying very well. Wesley, not always, was this way. Um, early on in his ministry, John Wesley, our the founder of Methodism who lived back in the 1700s. Early on, he was bad. He was at this. He was on a boat coming to America. That's its own adventure that I'm not really going to get into uh, what he did or, and how his ministry here failed. But, but on the way over, he is on a boat coming from England to Georgia. And along the way, they go through a terrible storm. Terrible Winds raging, waters flashing over the top of the boat. Um, the ship is creaking and making sounds that you wouldn't want anything that you're depending on to keep you out of the seawater from making, right? And he is freaking out. He just knows he's going to die. And, oh, God, I don't know. I don't want to die. Well, you, know, you can just imagine how he's freaking out. What he notices, though, is there's a group, a Christian group on there, a whole group of them, the Moravian Christians, that are on the boat with him. They're in the same predicament he's in. They're on the same boat. When he talks to them later, like, oh yeah, we knew we might die here. They aren't, they aren't ignorant to the situation. But their reaction is completely different. They're just sitting there singing songs and looking as calm and placid as can be. And in the midst of all that, John Wesley realizes he's not very well versed or practiced in... Uh, what was actually then very talked about, and, and a pra you know, there were whole books written on this, something called the Ars Moriendi, and that's Latin for the art of dying. Um, and believed in, he, so he spent some time after that encounter working on himself, reading up, studying up, and getting himself ready for the art of dying. We don't think about that a whole lot these days. How am I going to die? Um, and I don't mean, is it going to be, <coughs> you know, like that or a different way? I mean... More, how am I, am I going to be at peace? Am I going to be ready when that comes? Well, Methodists from early on in Wesley's day were actually known for being very good at dying. This was an actual quote from an actual letter that John Wesley received from a physician in one of the areas where um, this physician had dealt with a lot of Methodists and a lot of non-Methodists. And here's what he says, the physician says. He says, most people that I encounter die, almost die, out of fear of death. They're so scared of death, they die from being scared to death, right? They were probably not good in the first, well in the first place. But he says, like they're not dying well. But your people, they're not afraid to die. Your people die well. You know, when you can have that trust and that assurance that God's with you, that God's love you, and that you can look look people in the eye and say, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Death is completely different. And I'll tell you, I've seen it. And now almost 30 years of serving as a, as a full-time pastor, I have been around a lot of hospital rooms, a lot of nursing homes, a lot of homes with people in their last moments, their last days of life. And I will tell you, there is a very palpable difference between those who believe that when you die, that's just it, versus those who, when they die, trust and know, both for themselves, if they're the one dying, or for their loved ones, if they're the one dying, that 
this is a finish line, but it's not the end. There is life with God beyond the grave. So I'll, I'll illustrate a little further. The ones that I've been at their home, or with, with the family and with the loved one, that, that just think, this is it, when you die, um, you're done, it's the end, fine, stop. They're frantic. They're frantic. Because their loved one is just about to cease existing. It's sad, it's tragic. They do everything they can to get one more ounce. They will convince them to themselves or they'll try to convince their loved ones to take every quote-unquote heroic measure, everything that could possibly advance and keep them alive, no matter what the state, for a little while longer. Now, occasionally, people, the dying one in those states are like, this is too much, I can't take it anymore. And, and even though they know it's in existence, but there is a despair and a sadness that comes from not trusting and knowing that Jesus is going to carry you through. And then contrast that. When, when families and loved ones know that it is a finish line, but it's not the end of their existence, that Jesus is going to take them home, it's an entirely, entirely different experience. Now, I'm not going to tell you there's not a lot of sadness and crying, even then. There is. I mean, of course. This loved one, your spouse, your parent, your child, your friend, your cousin, whatever it is, to be there in that moment and to know that they're not going to be there with you the way they have been for a time, that's not fun. It's not easy. Christians have every right and it is not a lack of faith to cry and be sad and be very sad in those moments because your loved one is not going to be with you for a time. But for us, we know it's a pause. Right? It's a pause. You're going to see them again. They're going to, we're going to join them again one day when heaven comes. And so while there's sadness, there's not despair. While it hurts, we have hope and trust and know that it's not the end for him or her. It's just one step along the way. And I'll just tell you, the peace and the comfort that comes for people in those moments is, is huge and makes all the difference in the world on how people face death. No wonder Methodists, and it's not held just to Methodists, of course, but any and all who fully trust and know God's love and that God not only allows people to live on, but desires it fully. See, that's what I really think we have to catch on to in order to have this full trust and to live now in such a way that we have that peace now and when the time comes for our, our loved ones and ultimately for us, we can have that. And that is to know just how much Jesus loves you. He loves you so, so much. I, there's just no words for it. However much you love the person or the pet or whatever it is for you that you love most in this world. And it can be a lot. And I'm not diminishing. But it's nothing compared to how much God loves you. God isn't just like, eh, take it or leave it heaven for you. No. He wants you there. He wants you there with every fiber of God's being. God wants you in heaven. He made you. God made you. God values you. God treasures you. And so God wants you there. Can we mess it up? Can we reject it? Yeah. We can. But God's not trying to keep you out of heaven. God's doing everything to pull you in. Every bit of our teaching, every bit of what you hear from a pulpit, from what you hear from other believers, it's all driven. It's all Jesus saying, hey, I love you. I treasure you. I want you in heaven with me. And the reward is the salvation of our souls. It is life now and forever with God. You know, us Christians sometimes, 
are told, um, well, you know, you focus on, on heaven to the exclusion of life here on earth. Well, sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. And sometimes we use that as an excuse to not love people as much as Jesus loves them, to not treasure people. Um, that's, that's not God. That's, that's us in our still sinful natures when we live and act that way. Jesus wants you. And he went to that cross. He rose from the dead. And that's why we're doing this, talk, doing this talk right after Easter. He, the resurrection was to win heaven for you. He's offering it to you. And that is available to you. And it's if we accept that now, we don't only die well. We live a lot better now. And we'll still have pain and hurt. Things won't go the way we want them to go. Not all of our wishes will come true. But we will know that no matter what happens, the ultimate end of the story with God is always good. The steps along the way may include a, a crucifixion. What is for Jesus? may involve rough stuff happening, but the end of the story, for those who place their trust in Jesus, the end of the race is always good. May you feel and know that confidence and that love that Jesus loves you so much that he died for you, that you have this day ahead. Go ahead and show the other scripture, the last one there, verse uh, 27, or verse 8, I'm sorry, 6 or 8. Now there is in store for me, this is how Paul concludes this little part of the passage, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You don't have to be the world class first place of all the world Christian in order to get this. He, but, but all who desire Jesus and his appearing, who make it the guiding direction of their heart, their first love, Jesus, he's... He's going to reward you. May we live in ways now that show that we're living well so that we can die well. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you for your love for us. Help us to feel and know your love today and forevermore. Thank you that you died for us. You showed us how to die so that we might live for you. Thank you, Lord. It's in your holy name. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Let us stand as we sing.
remain standing as we continue on now with our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, the Father Almighty, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As you are, we go to our time of prayer together this morning. Uh, we did have several that had uh, surgery this week. Joe Bowers, Monty's wife, had uh, carpal tunnel surgery this week. And from what you're telling me, is recovering as to be expected so far so well. So pray there. Um, Dave um, Brennan had cataract surgery this week. Also, here's an great answer, another great answer to prayer. This time last Sunday, uh, we got up here and told you that um, Marilyn Gouldy was awaiting hip surgery, no, knee surgery, sorry, um, and um, was scheduled for it in June, but was on the list that if there was a cancellation, hopefully she'd get it sooner. And I'll just tell you, she was really hoping and praying and feeling she wanted to have it sooner. Well, guess what? The next day after we prayed for that in church, she got a call and she had her surgery on Friday and is doing well. And so I want to thank God for that. Yeah, you can clap for that, for God for that. And so we just, uh, there's others that have had surgery and things going on. We're glad that you're back, some of you are back with us today. And we just continue to know that our God is a God who, when we pray, God answers. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for answering prayers. Thank you for letting us see you heal, for answering prayers, for bringing hope where there's a hopelessness, for help where people feel helpless. Lord, we thank you that this world is tough, but we don't face it on our own. You're right there with us every step of the way. Lord, you know the prayers of our hearts. You know the ones that we've been praying for a really long time. And Lord, even though it is a struggle for us to understand, we just give it all to your will and pray your will be done. But we also know, God, that you do answer prayers, and so we thank you for that. And Lord, just be with us, strengthen us for the journey of life and help us to be your people that no matter what comes, we face it with trust, not in ourselves, but in you. We thank you, Lord, for the answers to prayers you've given us. We continue to pray for those that are ill, who are facing surgeries or illnesses and those that are recovering from all the same. And Lord, we just know that you are with us in all things. Help us to see how great you are, how much you love us, and how much we can trust in you. Thank you for every blessing that you put in our lives and help us to be a blessing to others. It's in your holy name, Jesus, we pray this all as we lift up the prayer now you taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we continue on now and prepare to take our tithes and offerings this morning. Um, today is one of the several annual offerings that the United Methodist Church as a whole denomination takes up. It is Native American Sunday. And so today, uh, Native American Ministry Sunday. And you'll see there, you see that you may not be able to, maybe you can read it on the screens. 50, half of what we collect day stays in Oklahoma, 25% uh, grants. Uh, for outreach and ministry, and 25% goes for scholarships for seminary education. Your own senior pastor, Shiloh O'Neill, 
Native American heritage. She actually told us in the first service, she over three years received $60,000 in help in her seminary education because of the offering taken up on this Native American Ministry Sunday over, the, over a number of years. And so um, we just um, rec celebrate to recognize and support Native Americans and their contributions to society in the United Methodist Church. I don't have to tell you, um, Oklahoma is a place with a high Native American population and we want to love on and support them and help them as there's still a lot of prejudice and a lot of institutional things that keep them down and so we want to have uh, this time to support that. If you want to give to that, just place it on your check or uh, if you do it online through Tithely with the QR code or whatever, just mark that you are giving to Native American Ministries Sunday. Let us pray together. Lord God, thank you for this blessing and this day and all the ways that you watch over us. God, help us to be generous with you and with others so that all might know your good news and might hear the good word that you have and bring hope and help to all. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
I know whom I have believed. service. Just a few quick announcements. You already saw, we already talked about Native American Sunday. Already talked about the Passing the Torch Legacy planning event next Saturday. Sure hope you're able to sign up and come and be a part of that. Also, if you have a if you have or are a high school or college graduating senior, our Senior Sunday is going to be May the 5th and we'd like a current picture of you and also a childhood, early childhood picture of you for uh, that presentation on that day if you can give us that. Well, hey, has was, he never failed me yet. Was that not magnificent? That was great. By the way, thank you all choir for that. Um, also, um, just uh, the music today, so great. And this last verse, I just, you know, he, to say, I know whom I believe in, that I can trust him on that day, and that he's never failed me yet. So let's, uh, if you would, put up that last scripture, verse of the scripture, and let's just say it, say it for yourself right now. Say it with me. Say these words of Paul with me. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What wonderful words to be able to say. You can trust in those if you trust in him. May you go forth knowing he doesn't fail. We can trust in him on that day and all the days before and after to fulfill his promises and hopes to bring us to the place he has made for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may you go in peace. Amen. Amen.